All right, let's talk a little bit about thermoregulation. It's the process of regulating the body's internal temperature. Most animals are categorized as either ectotherms or endotherms. Ectotherms are more commonly referred to as cold-blooded, but I would rather you think of them as what we call thermoconformers. And that means that their body temperature can vary greatly with the external environment. They don't control their internal environment. As the external temperature drops, the body temperature drops. And this causes the metabolic activity in the body to decrease. As the external temperature rises, the body temperature also rises. And this causes an increase in metabolic activity in the organism. Organisms include most fit or ectothermic organism examples include most fish, reptiles, amphibians, and pretty much all invertebrates. A big advantage of being an ectotherm is that the organisms don't have to use energy from ATP to produce heat and to regulate body temperature. This means that ectotherms don't need to eat nearly as much or nearly as often as endotherms do. A disadvantage of being an ectotherm is that ectotherms normally can't live in places where it gets too hot or too cold. If they do happen to live in these environments, their activity is limited to only certain parts of the day or certain seasons of the year. For example, if you were to find a snake in the desert, typically it's only going to be active in the, the evenings or at night when it's cooler. Endotherms, on the other hand, are commonly referred to as um, warm-blooded. I want you to think of them, though, as thermoregulators. They're organisms that maintain their body at a metabolically favorable, nearly constant temperature using the heat set free by internal bodily functions like cell respiration, for example. They don't rely purely on the ambient heat from the environment. If the temperature gets too cold, they can speed up their rate of metabolism to generate more body heat. They also have other adaptations designed to help regulate that body temperature. Changes in the external temperature have little impact on the internal temperature of the endotherm. They regulate their internal temperature very closely. If the external temperature drops, an endotherm will either generate or trap excess body heat to maintain a constant internal temperature. Some possible mechanisms of doing that include shivering, increasing the rate of metabolism or cell respiration, vasoconstriction or narrowing of the blood vessels located near the skin to keep heat in the body. If the external temperature rises, an endotherm will do something to release body heat to the environment. Some possible mechanisms include sweating, which leads to evaporative cooling, panting like a dog would do, vasodilation of blood vessels located near the skin, so widening those blood vessels, letting more blood flow near the skin and letting more heat out of the body that way, or decreasing the metabolic rate. Endotherms often use negative feedback loops, like the one we'll see on the next slide, to regulate their internal temperature. Examples of endotherms include birds, mammals, and a few species of fish, not, not many fish. A big advantage of being an endotherm is that the internal temperature is independent of the external environment. This allows endotherms to be active and to live in almost any habitat on Earth. A disadvantage is that in order to maintain that constant internal temperature, the organism has to use a lot of energy. This requires endotherms to eat a lot and on a regular basis. So here's that negative feedback loop we were talking about before. So let's say that um, the body temperature rises, maybe because you're exercising. So that's the stimulus. There are receptors in the skin and in the brain that, that measure that increase in temperature. The control center for this is the hypothalamus. So it, it knows there's a change and it's going to send out messages to uh, an effector, in this case, a sweat gland, telling that sweat gland to release sweat to the surface of the skin. So that's the response. The, the sweat's released, it evaporates, and the body cools. Body temperature goes back down toward the set point of 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Notice a similar thing happens on the bottom part of this figure eight negative feedback loop. 
let's say that the stimulus is that body temperature starts to drop. Maybe you're out in the cold. So again, those receptors in the skin and in the brain pick up that drop in body temperature. They communicate it to the hypothalamus, the control center. In this case, it's going to send out messages to the effector, which is going to be the skeletal muscles. Telling those skeletal muscles to shiver, that generates frictional heat. So that's the response. And that's going to continue. That feedback loop is going to continue until the body temperature gets back to its normal set point temperature of 98.6 or 37 degrees Fahrenheit. 98.6 Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, I should say. All right, that's it for thermoregulation.